Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We're so glad you're worshiping with us and uh, that you've chosen to join us for this service as we uh, worship God and dig into His Word together. You know, in 2016, there was a Pew Research poll that studied uh, people that were, had no religious affiliation of, uh, of any particular uh, denomination or religion. And they asked them a, a series of questions. Two specific answers are very interesting. One, 72% of those that were uh, interviewed or surveyed said that they believed that heaven existed. 78% of that same group said that if heaven existed, they believed they were good enough to be there. That's a shocking and really kind of a, a confusing statistic. That means more people believe they'll be in heaven than believe that heaven actually exists. And they essentially said that what, if, if heaven exists, I'll make the cut. I'm good enough uh, to be in. And this is not that uncommon if you think about it. It's very common to hear people say things like, you know, I'm a good person. I'm not perfect, but I'm a pretty good person. Well, what do we mean by that? We rarely talk as if we understand what that even means. We just say, I'm a good person, as if that settles the matter. But we don't think deeply about what do we mean by good. We just throw that term around. He's a good guy. She has a good heart. They're good people. This is good for society. But what, what do we mean by good? What's the standard by which we call something good? And how do you ever know that you're, quote, unquote, good enough? Well, those questions are really swirling around the heart of what I want to talk to you about from Mark chapter 10 in our series uh, called Following the King, discovering who Jesus is and what it means to follow him as we look through Mark's gospel. So let's look at Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27, at a story that will be familiar, at least in some parts, to many of you. As he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. It's a fascinating story. It, it's, a, it's a powerful story. And I think it's familiar to many of us. As a matter of fact, you probably are familiar with this story, at least in part, about the rich young ruler. And sometimes the fact that we think we know it so well can be in our way of really hearing what God wants to say to us through it. So let's, let's just pray and ask God to tell us what He wants us to hear through this story. Father, we've read Your Word and we sometimes presume to know it or don't want to hear it. So we're asking You now to help us lay aside our preconceived notions, the barriers in our minds and hearts, that You might speak to us what You want us to hear. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, what, what do we know about this guy? What, what are we aware of? Well, actually, this story is in what we call the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you put all three accounts together, we get some more details about this, this, this individual. All we know from uh, Mark is that he's wealthy. And we read in, in um, Luke, we're told that he's a ruler. The Greek word means influential, that he may, maybe he's a civic leader, maybe he holds some office in the, in the town, but he's a well-respected, well-thought-of, influential person, a leader in the community. And Matthew's gospel tells us that he was young, so he's not an old guy. So you have a wealthy, young, influential person. Uh, in Timothy Keller's book uh, on, the, on, this, on Mark's gospel, he says that he, he probably was good-looking as well. 
So you have this, this image of this person who's wealthy, influential, uh, and a young person. By all accounts, he's a good guy. He makes a good living. He has a good reputation. He enjoys a good life. People think good thoughts about him. And yet, there's something missing, such that he would come to Jesus and ask, what, what must I do? I've got this good life, but I feel like I don't maybe have it quite enough. I'm missing something. I've, I remember years ago talking to a, a guy I got to know who our sons played football together, and he knew I was a pastor, and he made an appointment to talk with me, and we were having lunch together, and he said, you know, very similarly, I make a good living, I have a good life, my family's doing well, but I feel like I'm missing something. That's a very similar situation here. And it brings up what I want to talk to you about called the question of goodness. The question of goodness. Notice, he calls Jesus good teacher. And Jesus turns it around on him and says, why do you, why do you use that word about to talk to me? As, why do you address me that way? Do you understand what you're saying? In a sense, Jesus says, do you know who you're talking to? Let's look at verses 17 and 18 once more. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, there's the phrase, what must I do? What a, what a qu question that is to inherit eternal life. By the way, we're going to see eternal life, kingdom of God, and salvation used as synonyms for the same central question. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So the man runs up and kneels down. This is really interesting. He's got the right posture. He comes to the right person. He comes to Jesus with the right question. He's asking about eternal life. That's an important question. He kneels down, a posture of humility. He's addressing his question to the right, the source of truth, Jesus himself. By all accounts, he's a good man. But Jesus says, why do you call me good? What he's getting at is you're missing something important. Your understanding of goodness is off. It needs reframing. Do you even know who you're talking to? In a sense, Jesus asked him. I think most of us think of goodness as kind of what I would call a morality ladder. So if we just use a drawing here to illustrate this point. Well, if I could get the drawing. There we go. I think most of us think of, a, the, of goodness as some sort of, you know, God's up here and he's perfect. He's morally perfect. And of course, we're not God. We're nowhere near him. But we're, we're sort of on this ladder approaching God, somewhere on this scale, you know. Uh, and there's different people on this ladder at different, you know, if, if we say God's up there perfect, then, you know, I don't know who's down here. Maybe, of course, metaphorically Hitler or, you know, somebody that you think is really, really bad. Maybe Aaron Rodgers or something like that. Somebody really, really a bad person is down low. And then we could put different people in our culture. And who do we think of as good people in the world today? Well, you know, in the, in the New Testament, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul. You know, I don't know, what do you think? Maybe uh, somebody like Mr. Rogers. He's a good guy. Uh, Mother Teresa. Certainly people would assume that she's a good person. Nelson Mandela. Maybe, I don't know, MLK. Uh, Rosa Parks, we can go on and on, right? People that, generally speaking, we agree these folks are good, good people. But, but here's the question. We would put them in different places on this ladder uh, uh, based on their quote-unquote goodness, but where do you put yourself? Where do you go on the morality ladder? Well, you know, I, I think of myself as a fairly decent guy, but I'm well south of, of Mr. Rogers and St. Paul and Mother Teresa and Nelson Mandela, so I'm down here somewhere. And actually, if you read the New Testament, you find out the Apostle Paul says that he is the chief of sinners. So he puts himself way down here. Well, what does that mean? The question is, how do you place yourself on this morality ladder? How do you know where you rank or where you fit? And how do you climb it? How do you know what's good enough? How do you ascend and make progress? I, I, and if you could make progress, how do you know you're, are you getting closer to God? Are you measuring up? Jesus is setting up the, the, the discussion here to say, your premise is flawed. Your whole understanding of what is good is wrong. Even if you could climb this ladder that you're on and you think you're doing pretty well, even if you could ascend, you'd be no closer to God than you are now. And then Jesus moves right into quoting from the, the Old Testament. 
the law. If he, he moves right to Mark, let's look at verses 19 through 20 of chapter 10. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. What a fascinating exchange. Now, any devout Jew would have understood the answer to the question the man asks. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He is a Jewish man. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. They all knew the Jewish answer, which was keep the law, obey the law, and you'll inherit the kingdom. You'll come into uh, eternal life. So it's kind of surprising then that Jesus would quote the law because we know from the New Testament that we're saved by grace. That it's not in our moral obedience and law keeping that we measure up, but it's the grace of God because we can't keep the law. So why does Jesus quote from the Ten Commandments? Well, he's driving at something else. He's digging deeper into this man's heart to reveal something. And to understand that we need to talk about what Jesus cites or quotes and what he doesn't cite or quote. So he quotes from the um, first, uh, the last five, excuse me, commandments of the Ten Commandments. And he leaves out one, which, which is, uh, he says, he places it with do not uh, covet. He says, do not defraud your places that for do not covet. So he says, you know, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal. These, are, these last half of the Ten Commandments are all about our horizontal relationships, how we relate to other people. And then he doesn't mention the first four commandments, which begins with, anybody know? What's the first commandment? Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. And the next three are about our vertical relationship, how we relate to God. So Jesus is saying something very important by what he doesn't quote. He quotes and he cites, the, as an example, the horizontal commandments, how we treat other people. And the man says, I've done that, I've done that. Even when Jesus replaces the, the, the commandment, thou shalt not covet, with don't defraud, it's interesting, because what does it mean to covet? It means to treasure something, to value it in our hearts, to give it a, a place of significance in our hearts, the place of God even. Jesus is leaving those off because that's the guy's issue. That's precisely what he's driving at. You shall have no other gods before me. And I think it's interesting that when Jesus, when this man claims, I've kept all these. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read this story, I thought, really? Is this guy kidding himself? Is he, uh, no, you've never broken any of them since you were a boy, not one? Let's, let's give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Not, I don't think he's saying, I've never made any mistakes. I think he's saying, I have been diligent to keep those commandments. I have not used my wealth to exploit. I've not gotten rich off, the, uh, off of the exploitation or by uh, abusing other people. Uh, I've been a good person. I've been charitable. I've been generous. I've treated people fairly. I haven't cheated. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen. He's probably being honest. And Jesus accepts him at his word. He doesn't, he doesn't say, liar, you're lying. He says, essentially, okay, he, he accepts the man's assertion. But he's pretty much driving at something much, much deeper. It's like this man is saying, you know, I've done everything right. I've been successful in business. I've respected in society. I'm morally upright and faithful in my religion. But I just can't help feeling like I'm missing something. What's missing? What is it he's missing? Jesus is driving at exactly that. He's missing his relationship with God. And Jesus leaves that out because that's the primary issue which he's going to address in a different way. Remember the ladder illustration. If we go back to the ladder for just a minute. I can never get this to work. Well, <laughs> we can't go back to the ladder, but that ladder doesn't go anywhere. If, even if you could climb it, you find out the ladder's broken. It's a ladder to nowhere. It doesn't, you, you can't climb it. And it doesn't get you any closer to the goal, to God. And this brings us to a loving diagnosis, a loving diagnosis. This guy is saying, I've done all these things, and I know that I'm missing something. Just tell me what I need to do, Jesus. That's what he's saying, right? What else do I need to do? That's really what he's asking. What else do I need to do? And maybe you felt that way. I'm, I'm doing the work. I'm trying to be a good person. I'm, I'm, but I feel like it's not working. 
There's a hole, there's a, there's a restlessness, there's a longing in me. And Jesus is going to tell him exactly what he needs to do. And what Jesus is going to say to him is going to undo him. He's already hinted at it when he says, why do you call me good? But now uh, comes the, the hard statement. Let's look at verses 21 through 22. And Jesus, looking at him, these, key, these words are key here, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. There's a lot happening in this little exchange. It's a shocking statement. It's especially shocking in a culture that assumed that wealth was a sign of God's favor and blessing. That's not true today. I mean, there are some parts of our culture that still see wealth as like that's a sign of somebody successful and they're a good person, they must have done well, but we don't associate it necessarily with divine blessing. In fact, it's more and more common today to associate great wealth with that person must have cheated. They must have exploited people. They must be um, unfairly, uh, you know, they're, they're wealthy and therefore somebody else is, is losing out. But in Jesus' day, in the ancient world, it was undeniable that wealth and possessions, because a person's wealth was not in their bank accounts or their 401k, it was in land and livestock and possessions. And this man had great possessions, therefore great wealth. And that his great wealth was a sign of great blessing. That was how the disciples and the Jewish people of the day saw it. He's a blessed man, favored by God. This guy's gone through his whole life trying to please God, and he no doubt sees his possessions as a sign that God's pleased with him. And then Jesus says, give that up. It's a shocking thing. Give up the very symbol of God's favor and blessing in my life? That doesn't make any sense. When we were talking in our preaching team meeting about this very passage, Pastor Brian said, it's like Jesus just reached into his heart and pulled out his identity and held it in front of him. I love that image. That's exactly what he's done. It's like he's just reached in and grabbed the thing that he has to have and held it up and says, I want this. This is what I want from you. And the man, it's too far, it's too much. It's like going to a doctor with you, know you're not feeling right, and the doctor says, there's something seriously wrong, but the good news is it can be dealt with, and here's what it's going to take, and you go, I, I, I just don't wanna go through that. I can't go through that. What's the one thing you feel like you cannot live without? You have to have this, whatever that is. That's the very thing Jesus says, one thing you lack Interesting. And something else interesting. This story uh, that we're reading about the rich young ruler follows immediately on the heels of an encounter of, with Jesus and a bunch of children. And the disciples are shooing the children away, and Jesus says, let them come to me. And he says, for unless you are like one of these children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There's a fascinating contrast between the children and this rich ruler. The story flows immediately after this, and, and the rich man is quite unlike those children, isn't he? They're poor, he's rich. They're dependent, he's not. They have no status in the culture, he has great status in the culture. They have no security apart from those who care for them, he has security, in, or he thinks he does, in his wealth. Perhaps Jesus is simply saying to this rich young ruler, you become like them, become dependent, poor, without status. Are you willing to do that? And it sounds harsh. It sounds ridiculous. Give all that up. But don't forget, Jesus does this because he loves him. Those two phrases, he looks at him and he loves him, are really, really important. The word in Greek for looked at him is emblepo. It's a penetrating gaze, a, a, a sight that sees beyond the surface. Jesus has a, a locked-in stare into this man's soul. He sees him. He sees the issue. He knows what the restlessness is all about, even though this man doesn't. And he loved him. That's the Greek word agapo. It, 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 literally, it means literally to desire the best for someone. When it relates to God, it's his divine, unconditional love that always desires the best for his children, even if it costs us, even if it feels painful, even if we don't understand it or like it initially. In our culture today, we think of love as to love somebody is to, is to always affirm them, to never disagree with them, to never confront them or challenge them. It's unloving to disagree or to challenge someone. That's not biblical love. 
Praise God that Jesus loves us enough to say the hard things to us. He challenges us. He confronts us. And he does it, though it's painful and hard for us to hear sometimes, because he loves us. Don't miss that. He looks at this man and loves him and says exactly what this man needs to hear, though he doesn't want to hear. Have you ever had Jesus do that for you? Have you ever felt God say something to you that you don't want to hear, but you look back and you go, that's exactly what I needed. That's exactly what I needed to hear, even though I resisted it, even though I chafed against it and wanted to run from it. You know, if following Jesus meant being interested in spiritual things and being a pretty good guy, then this guy would not go away sad. <laughs> It'd be a very different end of the story. I mean, you know, in the, in the team photo of good guys, this guy's the team captain. He's a good guy, and he is interested in spiritual religious things. But that's not the point. Or, or like many people today, I think, think Jesus just wants us to feel good about ourselves. He wants us to accept ourselves as we are and feel good about ourselves. If that were the case, then Jesus totally fails with this guy. The man doesn't go away angry or indignant or defiant, but sorrowful and disheartened. Grieved, in other words. Why? Because Jesus has just pulled out the one thing he can't give up and said, surrender this. This is what you're missing. You'll have no other gods before me. And the truth is, this is your God, your wealth and your status. Give that up and you'll have what you're looking for. You'll find what you're looking for. His problem wasn't in wanting more. I think, you know, we look at this guy and it's tempting to think, well, he, you know, he, all this great wealth and then Jesus, and he's got to give all this up. And it feels like that's just not a good exchange. Uh, it's too much. You're asking too much of me. But the reality is he, he want, didn't want more. He wanted too little. He saw it wrong. This is an excerpt from C.S. Lewis's essay, the, the Weight of Glory, which I've read many times and, and it's profoundly impacted me. Here's what he says. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what, what's being meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. This, this man missed it. He should have desired more for himself. He should have desired Jesus. This brings us to the last point, the impossible made possible. Jesus' call feels impossible to this man. He can't imagine his life without his possessions. Jesus is saying, can you imagine your life without your wealth, without your property, without your mansions and homes, without your servants, without all of that, or for you? Can you imagine your life without your 401k, without your retirement plan, without, you know, that, that path that you've got laid out for yourself, without your kids' college funds, without your home, without your vacation home? Could you, could you imagine life without any of that stuff, with just Jesus? Could you handle that? Would that be okay? Would it be enough? It sounds impossible, frankly. Who can live that way? This is the point. It is. An impossible thing if it were up to us. Let's look at verses 23 through 27. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed. By the way, that word amazed there and this word here astonished, it doesn't mean like, wow, that's cool, Jesus. It means uh, they were dumbfounded. It was confusing. It didn't make sense to them. At his words, but Jesus said to them, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, to, rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished. Let me pause there for a minute. I think this is funny. So Jesus says it's, it's uh, hard to enter the kingdom of God for a rich person. And they're amazed because to them, a rich person means blessed and favored by God. And Jesus like, they're astonished, they're dumbfounded, they're confused. And Jesus, to explain himself, says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And the disciples don't go, oh, well, that, that clears it up, Jesus. Good, let's go. No, they're even more astonished. It makes, they don't understand. And then he explains it. Because they ask the question, then who can be saved? Now, I, I think for many of us, we, we would expect people, we might be tempted to say, 
the rich won't enter the kingdom of God, or it's hard for them to enter the kingdom of God. Culturally speaking today, people might think, great, good for you, Jesus. Those rich people have gotten away with it for too long. They've exploited the poor. They've gotten rich off the backs of, of others' labor, and, uh, and so they don't deserve it. But that's not the way the disciples respond. They respond by saying, if not this guy, this good guy, then who? Who gets in? Then basically they're saying, none of us can, if not him. Who's, who's going to make it? If he's out, what hope is there for any of us? The whole point is this. On your own, nobody can. If it's up to you, if it's up to me, if we go back to that ladder, it is impossible. On your own merits, on my own merits, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God, inherit eternal life, or be saved. You cannot, ever. But what is impossible for me is not impossible. It's possible with God. The only hope is if God intervenes, and he has intervened. He does intervene. And that's exactly what his point is here. God intervenes. This is the gospel. This is the heart of the message. This is what Jesus says. With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. The impossible made possible. Sinclair Ferguson in his book, The Whole Christ, writes this. Only when he gives us new hearts to abandon everything for Christ will we be free from our personal forms of idolatry and yield to the principles of his kingdom. You can't do it. You can't climb there. You can't earn it. You know, we, we say often in our culture that uh, money opens doors. And certainly it's true throughout human history. It, there are undeniable advantages to being rich. But Jesus is saying, not this door. It doesn't open this door. In fact, it not, it's not only not an advantage, it might be a hindrance to you. Let me be clear. Jesus is not saying, and the Bible does not teach, that it's a sin to be wealthy. It's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, your wealth and possessions has a power to blind you to your spiritual poverty that you don't see. And for that reason, it might be the very thing that's keeping you from what you most need and in your soul most desire. A relationship with God in heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Timothy Keller calls this the great exchange. Jesus, Keller says in his book, is the true rich young ruler. He was rich. Talk about an understatement. All authority in heaven and on earth, everything belongs to him. He's the owner of it all, and he surrendered it all. His position, his power, his status, his wealth in heaven at the right hand of the Father, he gave it all up to come to earth and become poor, spiritually, physically poor, impoverished. Why? So that you, through his grace, might become rich, might know true riches. This is the great exchange, friend, is worth it, that you might come to him. You know, we're not told what happens to this man. He goes away sad, we know that. He goes off to his life, and we don't hear about him. He disappears in the pages of history. I don't know if he ever repented, if he ever came back around, if he ever made that great exchange. But the offer is for you and for me. Jesus looks at each of us and loves us. He looks at you right now and loves you. And he wants to pull out that one thing that's in the way, that you put on the throne of your heart, that you feel like you can't live without, and says, if you will surrender this to me, you will have riches of my grace and mercy and love and presence beyond your wildest dreams. That's the question for us, for each of us. That's the message of the rich young ruler. This is how the gospel works. You remember, we just a, few, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at what Jesus says, you must lose yourself to find it. We're all, we're all building our identity on something. We're all trying to find ourselves in some way. Jesus says, give that to me. And build your life solely on me and my grace, and you'll find riches beyond comprehension. Lord Jesus, we confess to you that each of us have things that are competing for the allegiance of our own hearts. And we, like the rich young ruler, come to you and with restlessness of soul, 
feeling like we're missing something. Forgive us for thinking we could ever climb the ladder. Thank you that you look at us and love us and will say the hard things to us. We ask that you would give us your grace and courage to surrender whatever it is that's in the way that you're asking for, that one thing, that we might have you and you alone. We pray in your name. Amen.